Welcome to the Carrie Newhoff Leadership Podcast on YouTube. My name is Carrie Newhoff, and my goal is to help you lead like never before. So what I do every week is I sit down with world-class leaders and church leaders, business leaders, and I talk to them about what made them who they are and try to have the conversation with them that you would have if you got to sit down for lunch with them or have dinner with them or really got to spend some time with them. So we go into the backstory and we explore what made them who they are and some of the principles they've learned along the way. So if you enjoy this episode, I would love for you to like it, to subscribe, and also to share it with your friends. And in the meantime, here's today's episode. Mark Clark, welcome back, man. We were supposed to be doing this in person, but Thank you, did sir. you hear yes. there's a pandemic? Like, did you, what? has that reached where you live? A pandemic? When? Uh -huh. Where? What is it? <laughs> yeah. Dude, that's oh, been I our know. life for the last year. I know. I wish I could uh, could have been there live with you, but uh, yeah, alas, the COVID keeps going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know we're we're in the middle, and again, this will air in February, but we're in the middle of like a mutation outbreak in our neighborhood, which led to a last minute cancellation of you and me hanging out in person and doing this interview and doing some other stuff that we were working on. But we will move into the post pandemic era, will we not? At some point, uh, we we got to believe that we got. I'm, yep. I'm hopeful. I'm thinking. Uh, I'm thinking by the fall, maybe. You know, I said that to my team the other day, and you know what they said to me, dude? They said, uh, "You said that last year." Oh no! Oh, how do we That's... get into a place where in the pandemic? Yeah, it's like you said that last year about the pandemic. I'm yeah, like, no, 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 no. Right. This is supposed to be over. <laughs> yeah, I think there's a lot of memes right now of, you know, when this is over is starting to sound like. You know, and then everyone's filling in the blanks, you know, it's starting to sound like whatever, you know, uh -huh. cliches that people use. <laughs> whatever things, people say. Things we all expect to happen that never do. So, but I'm, you know, I'm hoping they're, they're getting vaccines all going and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, hopefully we can, uh, we can get past this sooner than later. So I want to talk to you. We're going to talk about a lot of things today, but you've been leading a mega church during a pandemic, something you signed up for as a young yes, church that planner, was my, I know. Yeah, my uh, seminary uh, took a course on that. Mm -hmm. Leading yeah. in a pandemic. I, yeah. want, I want to know, like we're a year into this now, what has been the biggest challenge for you? Because you have been close to in-person gatherings for a year, basically. Yeah, March, the, the, the March, first yeah. week of the- Well, you uh, and I were doing stuff together. Like literally, we shot this course that'll never get- ever released. And, yeah. and then, and then literally the world closed the next week Yeah, when we finished it. So we never released it. Then we right. were going to film it again. And then the virus got in the way. So we'll, right. we'll do it, you know, in our nineties at yeah, some right. point. Um, but you've been leading now for a year, um, basically in the midst of a pandemic. So what has been the biggest challenge for you, Mark? Yeah, I think, yeah, we haven't uh, gathered since March. And so it's, it's been online. And the funny thing is, is that we were, we were about to launch a big, you know, listening to you, of course, continually tell me how important, I mean, we had bought people watching sermons for 10 years, but mm -hmm. really crafting a, a service, not just posting what we did in church online, but saying mm -hmm. the medium matters. We need to figure out how to package this, how to reach people online in maybe a different way. Um, we were we were just about to move into that, and then this pandemic hit, and it kind of just moved our timeline up by three or four months. And so, so you were already. Let me just stop you there. You were yeah. already thinking about like doing a separate hybrid version of like yeah. here's our online stream, here's our in person. Yeah, yeah. We were trying to think about um, if your if your audience is online, uh, they're obviously not. To, obviously, these are different mediums. Showing up at a place and being physically present and sitting watching content on a screen are obviously different mediums. So, how does that change? Uh, how do we? How do we? So, one of the questions that we've been asking and and trying to do uh, in certain ser sermon series and whatever that we're doing is to almost flip into like a Netflix mentality, where we're like, you know. Um, how do we give people controlled environment, uh, speak directly to them, you know, all of that, because I'm not in front of people anyway. Uh, yeah, you, you were already pre-recording your messages, right? Yeah, since March, I've just been in front of a cameraman and and I was already pre-recording before that. So how do you craft, uh, you talk about this all the time, everyone you want to reach is online. If mm -hmm. that's the case, does the way we do it, the, the methodology need to actually shift a little bit in order to reach that audience? 
with Bible teaching and worship and all that kind of stuff. So we were kind of already going down that road. This thing sped up the timeline. And now, you know, we've been doing this for a year and uh, it's it's been a challenge. So your question was the cha- the challenge, the big challenge for me is not uh, being able to be present. You know, Gordon Fee talks about this in his book about the presence of God, meaning his, his book about the Holy Spirit. He gives this illustration. He says, you know, when someone dies in our life, Ask the person who is married to them what they miss the most and what they'll tell you is their presence. Mm-hmm. You know, um, their their place at the dinner table is is now empty. The laughter is gone. The, the bedside is, you know, and, and I miss the presence. I miss being among the people of God. I'm a pastor. You and I got into this because we love people. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't hug those people at, in the lobby, chat, be eye to eye with them. Uh, I'm a, when it comes to preaching, Carrie, I don't, you know, care that much. I'm a bit of a monologue guy anyway. So I'm not a guy who's asking the audience for feedback. You know, the more, fe- the, I just keep talking over them anyway. Like, <laughs> you know, when they're like trying to clap or give me an amen, I just keep going. Cause I only have 45 minutes. Um, and so uh, yeah, I remember actually there was a, a conference I was being introduced to, and it was probably the first time in my life I was, you know, maybe 25 or something. And they gave me some big rowling introduction. And then the guy said, get up on your feet and give the man a hand. And so I walk up to this full auditorium of people on their feet clapping. And I just instinctively, the first lines out of my mouth were sit down and shut up. <laughs> and then I... <laughs> And then I opened up the Bible and said, this is what we're here, you know, whatever. And everyone's just laughing like, what is, what is with this guy? So, you know, that's kind of my style anyway, when it's preaching. Mm -hmm. So I didn't need people in the room necessarily for that. It's more of kind of a monologue of teaching and preaching, but, um, but being able to worship together, be present together, that's been something I've, I've completely missed. So. Yeah, let's go back to a year ago when you were getting ready to launch the the hybrid, the split experience. So in the room versus online. I'm sure it's changed now that you you know you got this year under your belt like everybody else. But what what did what was in your mind? What was going to be different about the in the room experience and the online experience? Well, that's kind of what we were ch- trying to figure out. And so um, part of it was, uh, as I'd said, the the flipping over to almost a Netflix philosophy versus just versus just kind of a camera set up in the room. Right. And then you, cause we were doing video, all of our services are video except one anyway. So we're mm-hmm. already in movie theaters where you would watch the worship on a screen. You would watch the preaching on a screen. You, all of that had already been. Yeah, been, let's let's drill down on that yeah. because I know, I think we talked about that before on a previous episode, but just give the thumbnail version because what you did was pretty innovative, I think for churches and you loved it. And I know others yeah. who are heading in that direction too. So you- not only pre-recorded the message, you pre-recorded the music. Yes, which yeah, seems we- totally weird, right? But just yeah. just give us the the yes. headline on that. Yeah, so just we in our in our uh, in our space where we do uh, the biggest, uh, we have nine locations in the biggest location. Um, we record it one week, eight o'clock service, and we'd have like three different cameras set up, and then that service, the entire thing, including the worship, would then be shown at movie theaters. Literally from here to well, Calgary is the next mm. province over. Um, for those for all the American listeners, <laughs> um, who have Rocky no idea what Calgary yeah. is, yes, yeah, um, north of Montana. Uh, and so, uh, we uh, you know, we would ship it to movie theaters, and now we're in going to Winnipeg and Toronto, so we're just moving toward the east. Um, and so they would watch the whole service. So originally this idea came to me while I was sitting in a movie theater, I was watching a movie with my kids and it was some terrible movie. And I was, you know, brain, you know, just off in my own world. And we were already doing video sermons, but I said to myself, what if we could leverage, you know, one of the things about movie theater churches, and I'm sure lots of your listeners do them and they're great, but one of the things that's hard is doing music live in those theaters because those theaters are built for sound to be dead. Yeah. And so you you start trying to play drums and you're trying to play, you know, and it's like a dead room. It's not actually built f- to play music within it. So I thought to myself, well, what if we just perfectly mixed an entire uh, 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 service and then showed it, including the worship, up on the screen? And everyone said, no, 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 that's not going to work. And one of the f- philosophical things that that I we decided early was 
don't do like the the cuts, you know. Don't don't cut to piano man and the, the mm. drummer, you know, zoom and like just keep it one big never move. So it's just you can see the like lights a on the shot. Top. You can bolt the camera to the wall. Right? Exactly. And then so in, in the live uh in the live recording experience, all the people are sitting behind the camera because I don't want if, you know, it's not some bad Russian bootleg movie where you're watching people, you know, walk across it and you're seeing hands up and whatever. Everyone's sitting behind the camera so that you can just experience it. Anyway, everyone said, this is ridiculous. It's dumb. And, and so this gave us a week with the file so we could make sure. Everyone said, it's not going to work. No one's going to worship to a screen and then watch a sermon or whatever. Uh and then we launched it and everyone within week two completely was in and we just started planting churches this way. So seven of our sites out of nine are this model and probably 70%, 65% of our attendance is in sites like this. So it can work. People, you know, it was about the community. It was about the, the, uh, the quality of the experience for them and they entered it. Yeah, and that's incredible because you kind of have that fixed camera. You see all the musicians. It's basically what you would see if you were in the audience, only yeah. in high definition. Yeah. And so that was that was kind of different. It worked well. I know a few other churches picked up on that. And you get an incredible mix, right? Because you pre mixed yeah, all of it. It sounds better than our other sites right. because it's a room built for sound. Hmm. Hmm. The other okay, the other so Venues yeah. that we have aren't built for sound. They're like, you know, built for some dog and pony show to come in on the weekend and, you know, dance around and throw, you know, confetti in the air or whatever. Yep. Things only Mark says. Okay. So <laughs> <laughs> what, what, uh, but preaching. Okay. I always joke with you because we know each other quite well. I've done a lot of stuff together, but in another life, you could have easily been a filmmaker, a cinematographer, a director, that kind of thing. You love cinematography. Um, and you have switched up your preaching style in the last year. So normally you would have been on a stage delivering as though before an audience or in front right. of an audience. And then you pretty quickly pivoted to like different looks and vibes. Can you tell us what you did and the difference that that has made yeah, in your view? I, I think the main one is just staring at the camera um, rather than staring at an audience. Uh, the audience is, I mean, especially in my case, the audience is in their house or in a coffee shop or, you know, whatever. And they're, I need to look at them. So the, the, the shift was uh, me not looking at an audience preaching anymore. It was me sitting in a controlled studio environment and staring at the camera and doing my teaching and my preaching directly to camera. And I think that eye contact with the audience is super important. So I don't know what that's going to look like post COVID. I don't know if I'm going to have to sit in a, you know, it's a few options, right? I sit in a live audience and I pretty well just preach to the camera, which was, you know, probably 30% of what I did before. Mm -hmm. Just basically ignore the audience in front of me and look at the camera. Uh, or we do it twice, which is not ideal, but um, mm -hmm. I still do the live thing. And then I record in the studio or third option uh, all of our services are just this. I mean, right now there's only one service where I'm live anyway. So it would just be flipping that one to uh, basically they're also watching the sermon I record in the studio and it's all to camera and the LED wall comes down and just shows everybody at all the sites. Uh, yeah, so, so yeah. this this is interesting, but what you've done, like uh, we got really nerdy. J.P. Pocluda came on last summer and did an episode about this. So it's like, you know, if you're recording live on a stage to get super nerdy about it, the camera's way back and you got a long lens that sort mm -hmm. of captures you. You're talking about a camera sitting five feet away from you, seven feet away from you. Uh, you were sitting for some of those messages. The lighting was kind of moody. It felt a little bit more like a movie than it did. Uh, anything. Yeah. And yeah. and you also switched to a manuscript, did you not? Um, yeah. So so what we did is, so there's two kinds of preaching right now that I do. So one is I'm in the studio, we have like a wall and we light it and I sit and I stare at the camera and I preach and I work through the text. And that's just my normal notes, mm -hmm. sermons. Then a few times in the year, what we did is we did a more controlled, like seven episode shoot. So I would go away to an environment, downtown Vancouver, 
uh, Airbnb for two straight days and we would shoot like kind of like a movie, two or three cameras, lighting, the whole thing. And that was all transcript. So I would write out the transcript, load it on the transcript, you know, the teleprompter, stare into the camera and just go. And then our team would go away and they'd edit this stuff. So did you see a difference in response? Like, did the audience say, hey, this is totally different? Did did one message yeah, tend it. to resonate more deeply than the other, get shared more often? Do you, do you have any sense of where that landed? I don't tend to I don't tend to look at a ton of that stuff, um, but I'm sure the team could you know, draw. I know they told me that the one of the series that we did like this was called the seven deadly sins. And what worked about it, I th- I'm not a, I'm not a topical preacher that much. Right. So what worked about it, it was easy because people could grab a hold of the topics and they were kind of spicy topics, right? Mm-hmm. Lust, greed, you know, sloth, you know, these things that everyone's kind of talking about anyway. And we and talk about we, sloth a lot in our house. So yeah, <laughs> your wife does. <laughs> Just had to jump um, in. Yeah. So, yeah, so so we kind of went on like you've probably seen the David Fincher movie Seven. So mm-hmm. you know the, the the aesthetical kind of inspiration for that series, I told the crew was like, here's what I want it to look and feel like. And so there were people that when they were watching it, they actually said they had like a reaction because of what they felt watching the David Fincher movie. And then watching the sermon series, it was like they were in that world again. And they were like, oh gosh, you know, kind of freaked them out a bit. So, um, but yeah, there was stuff around those sins because those are massive sins today. You know, those are things that people are talking about. Envy, you know, amazingly enough, I wrote this sermon on envy and I preached it and and I, and I, I can't explain it. I mean, other than, you know, the Holy Spirit is when I was done talking, the whole crew. Now, usually the crew, they're pretty zoned in to what I'm talking about, but sometimes they're busy, you know, off doing their, and I can see them, you know, mm-hmm. in my peripheral vision and they're texting and sort of this envy sermon, carry. I don't know what it was. All of them were sitting there zoned in. You could hear a pin drop. And right when they said cut, everyone just went, oh my gosh, that might be like top five sermons ever. Like that was insane. And I felt it too in the moment. So it was, you know, kind of a cool, cool little thing. And then capturing that, editing it, filtering it, and then delivering it to the world, you know, that way now your team has time to market it, to, 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 to position it in a particular way online and to your church and, you know, all of that. Because it's already done. It's packaged. Right. I shot it a month ago. Wow. And that that is really an interesting model. Did you find... Um... Like you already sort of hinted at this, but did you miss the energy of the crowd? Did you miss being in the room in the moment, seeing reactions, any of that? Because a lot of pastors would say, hey, I miss the moment. I miss the people. I miss the feedback. And I think you're probably on to, if we go ahead five, 10 years, this is probably what a lot of preaching will be like one way or the other, particularly in larger churches. I'm just curious what your take, and you, you know, you're kind of from the reform camp, so you've got all sorts of theological convictions in that area. I ju- I just love you to go down that 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 road a little bit and explore. Yeah, I, I mean, I didn't I didn't grow up in the church, and I'm certainly more reform when it comes to like certain theological things. I think I haven't caught up to whatever ecclesiological implications reform <laughs> theology is. So I don't have a very you know I see a lot of these guys going. You have to be in person. Yeah. You know, I would I would go to conferences, Carrie. I'd be sitting on the stage, and I guess in my ignorance of showing up to church when I'm 20 and just saying, guys, if it ain't against the Bible, whatever works, do it. Um, and I'm on stage saying, like, guys, video. And they're all like, you know, video's wrong. It's not true to the incarnational reality of – and I'm like, guys, if we're – I said this on stage one time. I said in front of 800 leaders, I it was four other guys, I said, look – if we're still having the conversation of whether video sermons are, 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 you know, allowed, um, are right morally, uh, we're going to be dinosaurs in 10 years. Like, what are we, what are you guys even talking about right now? Um, and so, uh, yeah. So anyway, so that, but no, I, I don't feel that, but I think what, I think just as a kind of, maybe as a, as a kind of a takeaway for, for leaders or preachers listening to this, it's, Maybe start to work on your, I don't want to say acting skills, because that sounds crass, but like your ability to craft something and deliver it uh, with no audience. And I'd already been doing that, Carrie. I mean, you know a bit of my 
sermon process. I talk about it in the Art of Better Preaching course mm-hmm. where I go down on Saturday. I used to go down for 10 years on Saturday night and at 5 p.m. until midnight, literally preach this thing with all the stories, all the fluctuations, every joke, every angle, every exegetical point out loud for four or five hours. It, like just grinding at this thing. And I think preachers probably need to be doing that more and more and more so that when they're getting on the camera and there is no audience, they can still deliver it with passion and, you know, the pros that actually connect and make sense to their audience. So, Yeah. And you and I do spend a lot of time together. I know last year you were at our church uh, north of Toronto and I pulled you aside after and I'm like, I can't believe the growth I've seen in you as a communicator. I don't know whether you remember that conversation, yeah. but part of it was you were always good. You were always gifted. You kind of have this charismatic, unique personality and that kind of thing. But what I saw you develop in, and I have such utter respect for people who do this, is what I would call the craft. And it's a difference between a gifting and a skill set. I think that's very biblical. You know, you can go to the Old Testament and, you know, when they're building the tabernacle, it's like the most talented you know, skilled people were working on the temple, we're working on the tabernacle, et cetera. And what I've found is I can get lazy because I have a gifting in something. So Ooh, I'm on edit yeah. number five of my next book. I don't, I don't know about you, dude. I'd rather write than edit. Um, mm. Editing is not fun. It's like, I enjoy the content creation process, yep. but the benefit of that, John Akef, another frequent guest around here. I talk to John all the time about like, dude, the way you work on your craft, that mm. like, you know, delivering it when nobody's watching, talking to yourself in the mirror, going, okay, why did that not land? And then going back and redoing it. On the one hand, you can look at that as performance. On the other hand, you can actually look at that as fanning into flame, a gift that you've been given. And like, I work hard on interviewing. I'm like, what is going to work on interviewing? What doesn't? I study other interviewers. I think about what worked about that, what didn't work about that. And I, I still hope I'm growing. I hope in a decade I'm better at interviewing than I am right now. And I think that I I just, you know, share that to say, I hope people hear that the right way, because I think we need people to work harder at their craft in that area. Um, What would you say, like, imagine Village Church, when it reopens, if you had to make that call today, which you can't, because we're still not able to redo, to do that. But like, would you go to the hybrid model where you're delivering in studio for the online audience and then delivering in person? at least once for those gathered in the I, room or, or what would you say? I, I think what I would try to do, uh, I would just off the top of my head, I would try to preach to the camera uh, at the eight o'clock service. The one we record that goes out to all the other sites. Anyway, I would try to do that uh-huh. and see if that could translate to online and then um, kind of um, support that with, worship might look different because it's not just taking worship and throwing it on, on the computer online and saying, this is now online church. It's like, how could worship be intentionally online? How could, you know, when we ask people for stuff, you know, all of that, but I'd try the sermon live looking at the camera more. And if that didn't work, then I'd probably go to in studio for the online audience. Mm -hmm. Because the online audience for us is, is expanding faster I mean, in this COVID moment, which obviously skews skews the data mm-hmm. a little because mm-hmm. no one can go out. Uh, but, um, you know, everyone's like, I'm growing around the world with my church ministry. It's like, yeah, because no one's allowed outside, bro. <laughs> you know, chill. So it's like, uh, but yes, we're hitting people in Wisconsin and New York and Ottawa and, and uh, you know, from all over the world. Um, and people have joined our church, meaning they're giving, they're in our community groups. You know, that has grown faster in this moment than any physical of our locations has ever grown Hmm. because you can just, as you know, could you just have exponential growth? And so um, that audience is extremely important. It's not some kind of like I focus on the real people and then this online audience can kind of get the, the video that Hmm. I did for the real people. It's like, no, no, this is a whole, this is thousands of people. Yeah. So they need, a focus on them. You need to talk directly to them. Anyway, so that, that'll be one of no, the No, I think that's a really good point. I want to get into the future church and I want to pick your brain on that. But before we leave it, I, mm-hmm. I just want to think about all the leaders listening who are like, Mark, that's awesome, man. You have nine locations. You're adding a couple more. 
you have videos, you have multiple cameras, you can do this, you got a crew. I want you to go back to 30-year-old Mark, who's planting Village Church and Mm -hmm. who doesn't have a big budget, who's got like one camera, if you're lucky, on a good day. And you're living in the constraints of a much smaller church or much smaller organization. Sure. How would you approach it if you were in that situation right now? What, what advice would you have to a leader who's dealing with more normal resources? Yeah, it's a great question. I think, um, if I go back, it was probably a year and a half in to our church. Um, we were in an elementary school gym, hundred people, 150 people. And a guy walked up to me and he said, I think this content's really good. What, here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to take this video camera that you bought. Cause I used to shoot all the baptism videos. I used to edit them myself. You know, I did all this kind of stuff myself. Right. And so he's like, let me put that on a stick, uh, put it at the back of the room and record you. And you can put these sermons online. Now this is 2010. So this is, you know, people are doing online, but it's not, you know, a ton. So I said, no, I don't want to make it look like, you know, whatever. he said, just let me do it. Let me do it. So he did it. And that year our church just grew and grew and grew. And that was a bunch of factors, but I do remember I wouldn't meet any new people that came into the church that didn't say, I watched the sermon online first. Hmm. Every, you know, it's kind of like, you know, if, if like, we got to think, we got to think missiologically about these things. Like if me and you are going to go to a, a Muslim mosque, Carrie, right. how are we, we're not going to go because, oh, look at the cute VBS they have. And uh, look, they cut their, they cut the grass and change the sign. You know, they put a new sign on the mosque, honey. I was thinking we should start going there. You know, the stuff church leaders think is insane. Uh-huh. You know, it's like, let's clean like, that. Well, our lawn is well mowed. So I don't know why yeah. more people aren't here. Let's change our name to community church. And everyone's going to go, honey, I think they're now welcoming to me. You know, whatever. It's like, what? No, a friend's going to bring you. You and I ain't going to go to a Muslim mosque without someone bringing us because we don't know what to wear. Mm-hmm. We don't know. We don't know if we show up on time. What happened? We don't know anything. Mm-hmm. And so it's going to be, it's going to be a friend, but people want to see inside. And so if that Muslim mosque had a online service that I could watch, so at least I know what I'm getting into. And so anyway, so point being, it cracked open this door that people could see in to what was going on. And then they just started to flood in. And we went to two services and three services and threw people outside and told them they couldn't come back and sent the Christians away, you know, and just said, go to some other church. We can't handle you, you know, whatever. Um, And it it was kind of crazy. So what I would say to them is put a camera on a stick, make sure the audio is good and the lighting's okay, whatever, and get your content out there and let people see in to what you're doing, to your message, to your heart. Uh, and that's going to be, that's probably going to be enough, or at least it's going to give your people enough to share. Right. Cause that's the idea, right? There's you as an organization sharing, but then there's also when I like the message and I'm like, I'm going to put that on my profile and share it with my friends. That's where things start to get amplified. Exactly. Um, so let's talk about the future church in person versus online. Um, when you reopen village church, do you think you will see the same numbers? I mean, the the stat that came out of 2020 was like the churches that had reopened to physical gathering were averaging about 36%, maybe in early 2021, that's jumped to 50%, 55%, but like very few people, if any, are at 100%. What is your sense of where that might land? Because you have, you, you theoretically, you've grown, right? During the pandemic, theoretically, yeah, from what you can Yeah, th- theoretically we have, but it's... um probably mostly in places that we don't have a physical location yet. I know, which is now another level of problem that we have to figure out how to solve. You're not alone in that. Yeah. It's like, okay, there's a hundred people watching in Ottawa or 30 people watching in Wisconsin or whatever. Well, you know, what are the, now the metrics that create a scenario where we would say we would launch a a physical location, a physical gathering you know, how many people, how much money being given, how much, how many leader, you know, all of that. So what we do is we have a online um, pastor who takes all these people where they're from and ministers to them and connects with them and says, hey, there's 14 people watching, you know, in whatever city, why don't you guys get together? You know, and when COVID ends, that'll probably be a little bit more go for a picnic. How can you tell that they're watching in a city? 
uh, just- when they give us their information is part of it. And then uh, some of the data that comes through the church yeah. online and, and all of that kind of stuff. But, you know, as you talk about moving people through the funnel, mm-hmm. uh, you don't, you know, it's not just about eyeballs. It's about like, it's about, did they sign up for a community group? Are they wanting to become members? Are they in alpha? Are they in freedom session? Are they wanting to give? And the minute they give us that information, now we can work with them and say, you're from this city, you know, these people are, you know, here's, you know, whatever. So try to build those communities there. So, so I think, um, I think it probably will be smaller for uh, uh, multiple reasons. I think a, it'll take a while for people's behavioral patterns to catch up. Mm -hmm. I do think we have short memories and, and people will click back in some way, but I think there has been, as you've talked about on this podcast many times, there has been a probably, you know, permanent strong, but there's definitely been a behavioral shift that has happened because of COVID and people. And then, you know, let's say that takes two years to, to, to get back to normal, who knows? Um, so I think we'll be less for that reason. And I think, uh, Canadians are, are classic late adopters, you know, right. We listen, we listen to our government, you know, it's kind of a a different thing than the American culture, right? It's like, Mm -hmm. I'm an individual. I'm going to do my thing. Don't tell me what to do. And Canadians are like, yes, sir. We'll stay inside. (laughs) Let us know when we can come out. Okay. But then we grumble about it, but we don't do that. Very passive aggressive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very passive aggressive. The most passive aggressive. It's a national characteristic. We're beautifully passive aggressive. Oh, I'm real happy with that, Mark. No, I'm not. You know, anyway. I, I, I hate that guy. <laughs> what a jerk. Oh yes. Hi. So, uh, yeah. So, um, yeah. So I think it'll take time for that to come back. And I, and, and I think there's been a permanent shift and I, I think people are, will be a little nervous, uh, you know, even when everyone, you know, whatever happens, gets their vaccines or COVID's gone or whatever the situation is, I think people's, there will be behavioral things that'll probably change as a culture. So I, th- I think we will probably, I don't know if it'll be 50%, 70%, 35. I don't know. Uh, you know, that's a big, but, but I think we'll probably trend similar to other, other churches. Yeah. You said something really interesting too, that was kind of a, a you just kind of slipped out and moved on, but like treating people online as though they were real people. Like it's not just, Oh yeah. Right. Hey, all you people in the room, which will be a fraction of the people who are watching online, how do you value them? And then second part of the question, how are you collecting their information? What has helped you get them into what we would call, you and I would call the digital engagement funnel, which mm-hmm. actually results, that sounds very technical, but actually results in like baptisms, stories, life change, community group, like community and connection, not just content yeah. consumption. Uh, so how do you treat them as real people? And then how do you actually connect with them relationally? Yeah. Um, well, we tell them they're real people and then we tell them we want a relationship with them. Um, almost every service that we do now. Right. So we don't, we don't just do our church services for the people who called village church home that now have to be sitting at their house. Mm. You know, uh, if we did that, then we would talk a particular way and we would act a particular way. We wouldn't be trying to like win people's affections. We'd go, oh, they're already bought into us. So we'll just Mm -hmm. do our church service to them. It's like, hey, if you are new with us, no matter where you are around the world, we want to hear from you. We want your information. Email us at this email if you want to do this. And then we get the email and our team starts a relationship with those people. So that's, that's how we treat them as people, but then also how we connect them. We, we do an invitation, give us your info. Mm. And then there's like a digital card or something or form they fill out online. Yeah. 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 We have like a website that, or a a page on the website that they go to fill out their info. And then it goes into a whole system of, of our team of three or four different people. It, It gets, if they're anywhere near any of our physical locations, it gets sent to one of our pastors there. If they're not, then our online pastor deals with it. Hmm. Um, I know you're not in the weeds like some pastors are, but any idea on the new metrics? Because you can see the YouTube views and they can either be encouraging or discouraging falsely. Um, Facebook views, same thing. Like everyone's trying to figure out how to measure this stuff. It's pretty easy Mm -hmm. if you have 100 chairs and there's 82 people. That's pretty straightforward, right? You kind of know. But like online, yeah. it's just weirdness, weirdness, weirdness. So what, 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 are, yeah. what are some things that are helping you even calibrate what's going on? Yeah, I think, and, and you know, we're all so different, right? You talked to me about this, about, you know, you are uh, so brilliant in your strategy when you think through this kind of stuff. I think I asked for the numbers 
of devices that that um, s- sign in um, to the church. So uh, the church online platform, YouTube, um, Facebook Live, give me that data per week, individual like IP addresses. And then I take those numbers and, you know, there's all kinds of debate about what those numbers represent. Do they represent 1.8 people? Do they represent 2.7 people? We have no idea. I know there's some people tell me that, look, I have seven people in my family. We watch this. That's one IP address, you know? And then on the flip side, you get someone who watches it for, you know, 19 seconds. Does that count? You know, no. You know, but so you're working with that data. And if that goes from X amount of IP addresses to low, low, low. So that's one of the metrics. Another metrics is uh, how many people do we have in community groups? Another metric is giving. Another metric is like how many people are signing up for our classes and wanting to become members still and signing up for baptism. Anyway, so those are some of the dashboards, you know, that we're uh, we're looking at to evaluate, you know, if we're doing, because at the end of the day, remember this great quote I read recently, and you've probably seen it too. I, I think it was John Tyson or something in that Q Ideas or whatever that thing's called. Mm-hmm. He said something like, it doesn't matter how uh, much influence your church has. If you're not making disciples, you're not a good church, period. Mm. And it's kind of like, yeah, like if I could get 12 million followers and we could talk about influence, is that actually the category? Is in is how much influence Village Church has on the world? Is that the category Jesus told me to evaluate in the Great Commission? Or was it make disciples? And if it's make disciples, then influence is great, but it's only the beginning of a process that I have to have other segments to, right, right. or else I'm just influencing. But that wasn't the Great Commission, to influence, no. right? So it's funny, in the early days of the pandemic, when we were talking about like three uh, second views and everyone's like, look at our numbers, we're blowing up. We got like 10X what we used to have in person. And I'm like, right. they'd be like standing in the parking lot and going, look at how many cars drive by our building every day <laughs> and how many people, right? Yeah, and so yeah, you got exactly. to take that with a grain of salt. And like, and, really it's relationship, right? At the end of the day, relationship with God, yeah. relationship with people. That's well, what it boils down to. Interestingly, it's it's even further than that. It's, uh, it's not only how many cars drove past your thing, it's, it's, and everyone was told to only be in their cars and drive down that street. <laughs> because yeah. we're all limited. Everyone's watching at home because there's nothing else to do. You know, I can't so, get out of my car. I keep, right. I keep having yeah, to drive by this day yeah, after day. Yeah. You're yeah. not allowed to get out of your car and this Stuck is on the, the street. only road. Now, <laughs> now staff, Let's all go out and count how many cars are passing by us. There you know, is a so, there is yeah. a health to having a skepticism to, you know, it's like don't believe your own press uh right. on the good days or the bad days, right? Yeah, there, totally. There's some wisdom to that. And I hear that. Yeah, now but make you, disciples. Yeah. yeah, you and I have yeah. we're gonna get to discipleship making, and I, I want to talk about your new book as well, Problem of Jesus. Um, but you and I have been texting back and forth just on the tone online and the criticism. And I don't want to tell tales out of school, but you're like, dude, I've you know. People have been meaner in the last year than they ever have in all your years of ministry. You want to speak mm. to that a little bit? How you're handling that? What you're seeing? Uh, yeah. How you process that and get up in the morning every day still? <laughs> well, uh, yeah. How I get up in the morning is is it's not as bad as uh, I look at some of some of the the people down in the U.S. or you know even across Canada, uh, and you realize, man. Whatever criticism, you know, and you get it too. Like I, I follow all your stuff, right? So I don't even know, Carrie, if you go on your social media feed and watch when people comment, but you'll, you'll I try, some, but yeah, there's a lot. So, there's a lot. So you'll say something as simple as, you know, uh, I don't know, whatever, five ways to, for leaders to stay, you know, uh, sane and not quit their ministry positions in mm-hmm. 2020. And you'll get people going, you know, it's not only pastors who have it tough, you know, you know, uh, I'm a whatever. And they'll tell yeah. what their job is and how tough their job is and how people in ministry are just, you know, and it's kind of like, you're like, yeah, but 
I'm just talking about people in ministry. Like, I'm relax. just trying to help you guys. Sorry, yeah, we were, we were, we're trying to do some good every here. Every single occupation and career on the planet and write blogs about that. That's not my lane. Mm-hmm. But people can't see outside the filter that they've got. And they're kind of, I don't know if it's because we're all sitting in our houses and getting fed, you know, uh, information all the time that's making everyone freak out, but everyone's apocalyptic. Everyone filters everything through a political mm-hmm. um, filter. And, you know, I, 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 I was just prepping a, a sermon on John chapter two before we started. And, you know, Jesus is turning over the, the, uh, the tables in the temple. And, you know, I start talking about the idea of like people were using this place to do things that it wasn't meant to do. Mm. You know, and and I, I I kind of go from an application standpoint into this idea that today everyone thinks everything is political. And so if like Carrie, you know, if you go to university hmm. and you're watching your academic professor up there and he's trying to talk about, I don't know, let's say he's a evolutionary thinker and he's trying to give you uh evolutionary psychology on why, you know, the alpha male in a in a tribe, you know, whatever. We go, oh my goodness, I can't believe he he talked about how males work and how mm. females work. I mean, and and but he's an academic. Academics yeah. don't don't they're not talking politically. They're just right. talking about psychology. They're talking about science. They're talking about how biology works. They're not they're not filtering it through your political skewed version of is this a narrative that's right or left? That's not what they're thinking about. And so, so much of what we need to try to do is try to transcend this like political narrative. And I think pastors, to come back to your question, they didn't get into this to become professional epidemiologists, <laughs> which is what they're ask, being asked to do right now. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's insane. I get, I get one email that says, how dare, this is not no joke. How dare you not get up and tell our entire congregation that they need to be vaccinated as soon as possible and that they need to stay inside, you know, at the cost of their life and the life of, you know, loving people. The very next email would be, how dare you not fight, fight the man and tell, and tell the world that they shouldn't get a vaccine Mm -hmm. and they need to let us out of our houses because this, how dare you, you're a leader, you know, and it's like, When I'm talking to people, people in pastoral ministry, they're like, people are emailing me about leaving my church all the time because of that reason and that. And I didn't say enough about that, but I did say enough about that. And that's how they skewed this. It's all, as as, uh, Andy Stanley shared on your show previously, every email that's similar to that, it's not theological. It's not ecclesiological. It's not about pneumatology. It's political. And so I think this is one of the tensions uh, that that we're all facing, and it's been a bit of a shift in the last year. And pastors are either trying to catch up, uh, they're trying to really look to their identity in the gospel and go, "I can't let this stuff affect me. Uh, I'm beloved. I'm called to this. I'm not called to whatever." Uh, or they're just quitting and they're like, "Forget it. I didn't get into this for this. I'll go work with my buddy at the insurance agency, and I'll probably make more money anyway." Has it made you? Has that climate made you more timid? or more nervous about what you're saying in public? Uh, yes and no. I, I think it's made me say, uh, make sure if you're going to say something that you know how it's going to be. So I'm trying to pre-spin it in my brain. Yeah, like I could have said this three years ago and people would have went, ah, and now it's like, mm, well. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. H- so how do like, you make sure that doesn't eat away at the core message? Well, it's interesting because, you know, for instance, when the the Capitol building thing happened, right? Mm. Uh, You know, I think I posted something about like, hey, because I'm I'm thinking about people who they sit around as armchair, you know, whatever, theologians, and they just, they, they don't like do stuff. So I basically quoted James, like, don't just be hearers of the word or, or hearers of the news or whatever, like be doers. Uh, like do stuff with your life. Mm-hmm. Don't 
Don't just sit and Don't intake. sit around and criticize the people who are doing something with exactly. their Exactly. And yeah. that's, a, that's a critique on both the left and the right. You right. got a bunch of people sitting watching Fox News thinking they're going to solve the world just by that. And they got a bunch of people watching CNN and MSNBC thinking they're just going to change the world by sitting. And I'm just saying, let's be doers, mm. right? And that was interpreted b- by both the left and the right as if I was saying, you know, basically you shouldn't care about the world and you shouldn't care about, you know, politics anymore. And I'm just like, I mean, I don't know what we're talking about anymore. It's not what I basically quoted the Bible. It said, do stuff with your life. Don't just sit around and think stuff. It's all I was trying to say. Everyone calm down. <laughs> you know, where a year ago, you know, it would have been whatever. So I don't think it, it, it holds me back from it. It just makes me go, okay, just make sure you put those filters on it you before filter. you, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I would be I would be the same way. Like when do you enter, when do you not? But you got to get this core message out and you've you've got to be sensitive to that. Well, you got a brand new book called yeah. The Problem of Jesus. So you wrote The Problem of God, uh, which has done really, really well. And these are both apologetics books. So I would love to start with this. Um, why problem of Jesus for your next book? Why and 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 let's go back to your conversion story because mm-hmm. you did not grow up. Christian, that kind of thing. What was the biggest problem? Because a lot of people, this is postmodern Christianity. Postmodern yeah. world thinking is, yeah, I'm spiritual. Yeah, I believe in God. Maybe small g God. Yeah, God is interesting. Mark, I'm not sure about your God. Jesus, yeah, Jesus is a good moral teacher, all that stuff. But wait a minute, that died, rose from the dead. Salvation, mm-hmm. weird. Yeah. Let's start because that was your context even 20 years ago yeah. when you became a Christian. What was your stumbling block with Jesus in your own well, life? Or was yeah, it? I, well, I, yeah, I came to church when I was 19 for the first time, but I had encountered Jesus when I was about 17, 18. A guy explained, you know, Christianity to me, a woodworking class in high school. And I was at that time doing all the stuff you do when you don't know Jesus and you're in high school and you're, you know, whatever. So, and then I came to know Jesus, had this profound confrontation uh, or, or experience. I mean, he, he confronted me and my sin and my life into the direction like it was I was supernatural going. supernatural or yeah. it was emotional or it what? Was, what? It was through, the only way I could, it was supernatural. It was through the Bible though. You mm. know, Augustine said the Bible is the face of God for us now. Mm. And I experienced that when I read the Bible, I'd be sitting out in front of my school, smoking half a pack of cigarettes, just reading the Bible. And then it would just like, it would change my life. It would change my heart. It would, I just had this profound encounter with, with God. He confronted me about where I was going in my life and how I thought and how I lived and all that. Um, so then I just started telling everybody about Jesus. Like I didn't, I didn't care. I didn't, I, you don't know what you don't know. And so I'm just like, there's, you know, two o'clock in the morning, there's dudes getting hammered outside my house and I'm out there, you know, smoking half a pack of cigarettes, telling them this is what Jesus wants of your life. And I see people come to Christ and I'm baptizing them in Lake Ontario at two o'clock in the morning. And I'm not even baptized yet. So I don't (laughs) even know how that works ecclesiologically, but it's like, I'm, I'm this profound thing happened in my life, but I didn't want to go into the church. And then I finally went into the church and, and, uh, and, and so your problem was more the church than Jesus. It was the church, but it was, there was things about Jesus that he would, he was, I would read the Sermon on the Mount, this, this, uh, this antithesis to how I was living, this alternate kingdom, this alternate way of life. And, and I remember looking at that going, this thing's a scandal because I come back to what you just said. And this is part of the, you know, the whole thing of the book is like, you take that like postmodern approach where Jesus is a good guy. The thing, I, I remember years ago watching an interview of Deepak Chopra, who had exactly that position, the new age thinker, you know, Jesus is a good guy and let's not get all this, you know, hell stuff or this Christianity where Jesus is the only way, you know, that's not really what Jesus and Christianity is about. The church created that. Just go back to Jesus and read the Sermon on the Mount. And that's what Jesus was about. And I go read the Sermon on the Mount and I'm like, Deepak Chopra, when's the last time you read the Sermon on the Mount? Because it's all about hell and exclusivity and all the, you know, that's where we get all that stuff. You know, so I think people go, oh, Jesus is about the golden rule and whatever. But you realize, as C.S. Lewis talked about, he never he never wanted that to be the position. There's never, when you read the Gospels, there's one of two things you can do. You can either throw Jesus off a cliff and kill him, or you can worship him as God and follow him. There's no middle of the road, what I like to call Canadian nicety. 
you know, this kind of like third option and third way Vague when it comes to spirituality. Jesus. Yeah. Which, by the way, yeah, yeah. if you are spiritual and you're American and you're millennial or Gen Z, it would tend to be more that kind of spirituality, yeah. right? right? Where it's like, yeah, I got a little bit of Buddha, I got a little bit of Jesus, a little bit of God, a little bit of stuff I made up, and that's my religion. So, right. I don't so even Jesus, need you, Clark. So, right. So Jesus has this great thing where he's like, no, we, vague spirituality isn't enough. We actually have to get explicit uh, about uh, who God is, who we are, how to find joy. What is salvation? What is the soul? Heaven, hell, you know, all of the, you know, did did this stuff, you know, did Jesus actually talk about this stuff? And if he did, what did it mean? And one of the things about this is uh, I think people are going to read the book and and from a, a what you're talking about, kind of the next generation, and they're going to see that all a lot of the reasons they're walking away from the church, right? So, so, so come back to this major problem we have right now. There's a generation of people leaving the church. Right. And they're leaving it for this list of reasons. This book presents a Jesus that isn't about those reasons. He, he actually counters those reasons and calls out people who live that way and says, this isn't, this isn't my way. You know, I, I, have a, I have a section in the book about discipleship, and it's talking about the idea that your life, I'll take this as an example, it's not good enough to just believe a bunch of stuff about the doctrine of Christ, but then you you live the exact same way uh, as your neighbor in regard to the timeline of how much you watch Netflix, how much you scroll Instagram, how much you just a non-contributing zero in life. Don't worry, I have a different Christology than my neighbor. That's not Christianity. Hmm. Christianity is a whole alternative empire that you exist within in both your beliefs, but also your praxis, your behavior, your way of being in the world. And in fact, in the discipleship chapter, I talk about the idea that your way of being actually shapes your affections more than we think. And sometimes we think we start with belief and then we move to behavior. But I talk about the idea that, no, the way that you get into the, the kingdom of God is you have to come out of all the other kingdoms mm. that you belong to in both your thinking and your acting and your living. So those might be things where you worship sex or money or power or whatever, and you need to be not only reformed into the kingdom of God, but deformed from all your other forms of worship. And that's what this generation wants. That's what I want. I, want well, I was going to say, like, it would have been would have been very predictable for you as a teenager, right? Struggling with life and everything to go, okay, I don't want that version of Christianity. I actually want the water down like God is whatever I want God to be. Right kind of thing. So why was that attractive to you? And why do you think that like clearer I, alternative has been attractive to thousands of people who, and particularly young people who now call the village church home? I, I think you have to call people to die for something. Nobody, mm. nobody gets up early on a Sunday. If we just use that, you know, microcosm example, and gives their life to something. If Jesus didn't real, if Jesus only rose from the dead in your heart, you know, if Jesus only rose from the dead, like, like as an archetype of some old myth, what am I getting up for? What am I giving my life for? What am I dying for? What am I raising my kids? And you know, it's not, it's, it's way more than I, an idea. If Christianity was an idea, then it would just be handed down. Jesus would have wrote a systematic theology textbook, handed it down and said, this is what I want you to believe. You know, but he didn't. Uh, in the book, I talk about, the, you know, Gladwell's 10,000 hour rule. And I talk about the idea that it takes, you know, the whole theory of it takes 10,000 hours to become a master at anything. And I go into the outliers theory and all of that. And then I talk about the idea that, you know, if you, if you, if you frame 10,000 hours, it's basically three and a half years, eight hours a day with a couple of days off. It's literally Jesus' ministry. He wants to wow. make these guys into masters. That's what he's, that's why he's there. He's saying, I'm not just going to take you away on a weekend and say, here's what to believe. It's I want to show you a form of living that you master. And then I need you to go get other people to master it. That's what discipleship is. You know, the great commission is make disciples 
And, and then a piece of that great commission that we rarely talk about is he says, you need to teach people. Notice he doesn't say, I, to teach people um, uh, all that I commanded you. He says, teach people to observe all that I commanded you. Well, that's a different game. Mm -hmm. I can teach an animal all that Jesus commanded. I can't teach him to obey it, to observe it. That's what this life is about. Why do you think that countercultural message gripped you when you were a teenager? I think I was, and I think people who are under 30, I mean, read this in uh, screw tape letters, right? C.S. Lewis has this great quote where he talks about the idea. I don't know if you remember this, where he says, uh, he's telling the demon, the demon wants his, his guy that he's assigned to, to die in, in a bombing in London. Hmm. And, uh, and the, and the uncle demon says, don't be so stupid. We don't want him to die because if he dies, we lose him. What you want to do is get him to older age, because when you get him to older age, he starts unknitting himself from the things God has given him and starts to knit himself to the world, money, stability, reputation. And then he has this line where he says, haven't you ever noticed that it's older people that aren't willing to die? That the young are more likely to just give up their life for something they believe in? That's so true. Right? Yeah. And it's like, oh man, I got, I got stuff to lose now. I'm 40 years old. I have a reputation and a church and a family and a mortgage. You know, when I was 25, man, what, what I got nothing to lose. And so Jesus appeals. I mean, remember, Jesus was mid thirties. Yeah. He's a 30 year old. He's like, what's up, players? Let's give it all up. Let's give it all up. And I'm at that age of my life. I'm like, what can I die for? I mean, look at, look mm. at gangs. You know, what are, why do gangs attract people? Because in the absence of being able to be communal and feel a part of a bigger story, they get to attach into this thing that gives them brotherhood, that gives them something to live and die for. It gives purpose. It brings a meaning, you know, teleology. We all need that in our life. Where am I going? Where is all this going? What's the purpose? Because it can't be to sit around and change the channel and post stuff that gets five likes on my Facebook for the next 40 years. <laughs> so that was really appealing to you as a teenager who was involved in a very different lifestyle. It was very appealing to me. A lot of people would argue, Mark, but it's not appealing anymore. You basically have to come around where the next generation is at. But, you know, Village Church has reached thousands of people under 40, probably even more during the pandemic. What is it about the counter? What is it about the countercultural message of Christianity that still resonates? Well, I think it's the idea that um, I think young people want to push against the kingdoms of the world. They see the flaws in the system, and they say to themselves, "I want to live for an alternative kingdom. I don't like the power structures, hmm. right?" I don't like yeah, you. You actually do see that in politics now, one way or the other. Yeah, young. young the reason people are leaving the church because they see the fusion of religion and politics hasn't worked. Well, people mm. have been saying this for hundreds of years. You know, go read Mark ten. You know, James and and John walk up to Jesus and go, "Hey, uh, can I sit on your left and your right in your kingdom?" And Jesus goes, "You don't even know what you're talking about. That that's not a thing. Power is not the way to accomplish. That's not what we're about." Right. We're not about power and sex and money and all the things the world tells you to care about. I think that movement, the, the concept of an alternative way of living and thinking uh, is appealing. I think the things that this generation values, for the most part, are things that Jesus values. And instead of, you know, and this is what I talk about in the book about loving God, discipleship, you know, miracles, Jesus as God, all of these, Jesus parables. You know, the beautiful thing about Jesus parables is that he's telling, you know, the, the chapter starts with this um, with this uh, story about me in the early days of Village when I was dumb. I would say, hey, I'm going to go to a coffee shop tonight. And I would tell the whole church, you know, invite all your friends. 
and I'll go in the coffee shop and for two hours, I'll just sit up in front of everybody and they can ask any question they want in public and I'll just talk to them, right? And so we would jam into these coffee shops and people would be able to ask anything. And so I'd sit there and, you know, all the classics would come up. And then this one person, this one time said, what do you think Jesus would be doing today if he was in existence? What do you think he would do? And I said, well, I'll tell you what he wouldn't do. He probably wouldn't hang out with religious leaders and academics. And I think actually Jesus would make movies. And the, they're like, what? why would he make movies? And I'm like, well, think about what he did with his life. He told stories for a living. The, one of the major categories James Dunn talks about from the ancients, even people outside of Christianity, mm -hmm. was they called Jesus a parabolist. That was, the, that was the only category they had for him because everywhere he went, he told stories about birds and two brothers and kings that did this and soil that did that. And the reason he did it, they weren't pithy little sayings with, you know, earthly stories with heavenly meanings. They were upending the whole narrative of a culture because when the, the empire of the world owns us, Carrie, when, mm. when we... Um, think a particular way. We are we are captive citizens of the empire when we can't dream of life otherwise. Walter Brueggemann talks about this all the time. But what if we believed the story that upended all of that, and we could literally our our imaginations function different? We're, then we're free, truly free. And Jesus told stories that just broke open all the furniture in our brains and reshuffled it, and he said. Hey, all you people think that by being a good religious person and reading your Bible, you're going to go to heaven when you die. Here's the problem. In a story of two brothers, it's that guy who stays outside the party in the end. He never gets in. And it's the young guy sleeping with prostitutes, spending all his money who gets in because he does it by the grace of God and coming to understand that he's a sinner. You know, all of that, these are stories that are messing all the categories up because he's trying to get people's imaginations free from the messages that they're pounded with every single day of life. That's why I think he would tell stories today because he changes the narrative of our brains and grabs our imagination and our heart, not just ideas. So anyway, that's part of the thing that I think is timeless. Yeah. What is becoming kind of classic form for you, and I appreciate so much about you, is you go through the objections seriously. I don't, or serially, I should say. I mm -hmm. don't know whether there's 10 in the book, but there's about that many. When you think about it, the historical Jesus, did Jesus actually exist right through to the death and resurrection? Mm -hmm. I think most people say, okay, if he, if he lived, he probably died. But like that resurrection thing, people are struggling with it. When you think about the people that you're reaching in post-Christian, post-modern Vancouver, B.C., what are the stickiest objections? Is it like, what would you say are the ones, those are the frequent flyer ones that come sure. up all the time and the they're the hardest for people to get past? Yeah. Well, I think you have two kinds. You have, you have the evidential questions, um, which are what you said. Did he really rise from the dead? Uh, did he really claim to be God? Uh, did he really exist at all? How do the gospels work? Those are evidential you know, questions of like, come on, give me some data, give me some history. Um, but then you have moralistic objections, which are, they're not necessarily based on like history. They're based more on like a repulsion that a culture might feel, uh, something that they right. don't like. So maybe Jesus did die. Maybe he did rise again, but oh, that teaching about. Exactly. X. Come X. on. Yeah. It's, it's sexuality. It's hell. It's, it's exclusivity. It's Jesus didn't claim to be God. Um, you know, it's the gospels are all made up stories, uh, you know, that a church just fabricated later, you know, all of those things are the big stumbling blocks that people say, I'm not going to give myself to Christianity because I, you know, I don't think any of this is actually legitimate. So the book covers all of that and more because it talks about, it answers those evidential questions. So there's literally a whole section on, did Jesus exist? And I quote, from some of the people outside of Christianity. There were 10 to 12 people outside of Christianity, actually antithetical toward Christianity, antagonistic toward it, that quote, that talk about Jesus of Nazareth as a historical mm -hmm. person. And then I talk about, okay, great, but what was Jesus actually about? And I think that section of the book will actually, if you're a Christian, and what I tried to do was inform both skeptics and believers uh, in the book, because if you're a Christian, it's gonna make you rethink what Jesus' central thing was. 
There's a whole section that rethinks like, oh, you thought, you know, 90% of your preaching and thinking about Jesus is this. Actually, the data in the gospels says that Jesus' main thing was actually this. Can you give us it, an example of that? Logic? Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. So, so if you were to ask a Christian out on the street today and say, what was Jesus primarily about? They would talk about maybe forgiveness of sins, um, loving people, going to heaven when you die. You know, these are the mainstay of Christian messaging. But when you go and look at the gospels, you realize bar none, the main thing Jesus was about was about the kingdom of God. You can't get, I mean, Every data, every scholar, every academic, every non-academic who's read the four Gospels goes, this is all he talked about. Every two seconds, he's kingdom of God this, kingdom of God that, kingdom of God that. And his whole message is about that. And all the stuff about loving people and going to heaven when you die and, and, and forgiveness of sins, it's all under this huge central message about the kingdom. So the question then becomes, well, what did he mean by that? Because, and one of the things I do pretty early in the book is I talk about the idea that, like, we have to be careful to not read the Gospels um, through our 21st century lens. Because you're going to read a word and you're going to interpret it the way you and Tony sit around and use it. Right. And that's hugely problematic because it ain't what a first century Jew meant by that word. So that's what we got to figure out. Because Jesus, as I talk about in the book, he wasn't a Democrat, he wasn't a Republican, he wasn't Canadian, he wasn't American, he wasn't a Chinese farmer, he wasn't a social justice warrior. He was a first century Jew, a rabbi walking around using their language, their images to birth a new world. And if we don't, if we can't get ourselves back into that mode, then we're not going to understand what he meant. Or what the gospels are trying. You know, anyway, so that's that's one example of like, if he was all about the kingdom, then what did the kingdom actually mean? And it doesn't mean castles and you know <laughs> territories or whatever. That's not how a first century Jew would use the word. Another example uh, I talk about in the book is is um, you know the example of of uh, Jesus in Matthew thirteen where he says you know uh, the Son of Man will come riding on clouds mm -hmm. you know one day, and we immediately go. This is about the second coming. Jesus, one day, is going to ride on clouds. He's got a short, routine-ish teeth, literally. And he's like, hey, everyone, I'm here. And he's a spaceman, you know, coming down, and that's how the world ends. The problem is, anybody in the first century who was a first century Jew reading Daniel chapter 7, nobody expected that. No one would have interpreted it that way at all. It was interpreted the way people understood Daniel 7 to be using the concept. It was apocalyptic literature, which is not ever meant. It's like reading Tolkien. It's not like reading the newspaper with images and symbolism and myth and fantasy. All of it is symbolic of, of things that he's trying to say. But when we just pull it out of its context, use it the way we want to use it, we totally miss up you know, misunderstand what he's going for. So the, all the way through, I talk about, you got to be able to understand, here's what he means by riding on a cloud. It ain't what you think it is. It actually means this. And it's actually far more fascinating that he means that in answer to the question that they're asking up here, which has nothing to do with the end of the world. It has to do with the end of the temple and the implication for the world, so on and so forth. Well, um, the time flies quickly and I'm really glad we're going to do another episode uh, later this year when yeah. we talk about reaching people, et cetera. But I want to wrap up on this because I would encourage people to get the book. I was really happy to read it, endorse it. It's a great book. And in your signature style, what is becoming your signature style, it has academic integrity and street smarts. That's just one mm. of the things I so appreciate about you because sometimes you get a really good book academically, but it's like yawn, yawn, yawn. Other time it's street smarts, it's like super shallow. And I think you bring the best of both. Um, but just to leaders who are thinking, you know, okay, I want to help convince people that mm -hmm. maybe they should take a look at Jesus. What are some approaches to apologetics or sharing your faith that you think just don't work anymore? It's like, yeah, yeah just, just doesn't work. Well, I think we're living, and I talk about this, I think near the end, I think we're living in, in the experience of the transformation economy. You And you've talked about this in, in stuff that you've done. I think this is very important for, for people to kind of hone in on that. You're not just explaining things worldview-wise or conceptually. You're explaining them experientially toward transformation. And I start, the whole book starts with a story about um, 
I took a trip uh, from Vancouver to Toronto and I was speaking at a conference and I go out for coffee with this guy and uh, we're hanging out and I've never talked to him in my life. He's a guy that I knew from 25 years ago or whatever. So we go out for coffee. We're sitting at Starbucks. We're chatting about life and ministry and whatever. And he looks at me across the table and he says, um, uh, Hey, I want to ask you a question. What's wrong with your house? And I'm like, what do you mean? Now, what he doesn't know at this point is that for the last two or three months, I've been waking up at two or three in the morning, walking around my house with a baseball bat, convinced that there's a presence in my home. There's something in my house to the point where I'm watching television and I hear a chair drag across the ceiling. And I think it's my wife. So I call out her name and she's sitting right behind me. And I run upstairs and all my kids are asleep. And I'm like, Oh gosh, there's, there's something in my house. So I'm freaking out to the point where I, I can barely sleep. I'm walking around my house every night. Something's going on. I go out with this guy. We haven't talked about my house at all. We're talking about life and ministry. He all of a sudden starts to go like this. And he starts like having this allergic reaction. I'm like, dude, what? get a bed and drill. What's wrong? And he's like, um, there's demons in your house. Do you want to know where they are? And I'm like, what? And he takes a piece of paper and he draws my house like he built it, Gary. I'm talking the blueprint, okay? He says, you have an office here, you have a bedroom here, yeah? He goes, you have a little closet right here, don't you? Yeah, he goes, that's where they are. And they're violent and they were invited there. I'm like, I'm in Toronto at the time. Like, what? I don't want to call my wife and tell her this. Yeah, yeah. Hey, I'm, hey, you know, hey, honey, I'm not coming hey, home. By yeah. the way, yeah. so um, so I opened I open the book that way because, because what I want to talk about is sometimes we break our lives up into two different things. We say there's a world of the questions of God and spirituality and, and soul and salvation and purpose and meaning and all that. And then there's the world of like raising kids and sex and politics and work and all of that. And we keep those worlds separate, but Jesus is the place where these two things are brought together and demand us to bring them together in such a way to say, to the, to come back to your question, we have to both, um, um, kind of own in ourself, but also present to the world that's walking away from Christianity. This isn't just about ideas. This is experiencing God. There's a transformation here. This is real. And you've talked about this, that the churches that are growing are churches that are small C charismatic in the sense of this moves from theology to life. Mm -hmm. And this is I said this in, in my sermon last week, and our, and our church shared this more than anything they've shared in, in years. Uh, I just said this. If you're looking at your young, you know, your, your high school student or your young adult, I got a 14-year-old now, daughter, and I want her to love and follow Jesus. I said, you're looking to them, and you're wondering, how are they going to be following Jesus 50 years from now? I'll tell you why. It ain't going to be the fog lights or the fog machine. It ain't going to be the cool lights. It's not going to be the cool leader. It's going to be that they have an experience with God. And when they experience him, that's what's going to hold them. That's what's going to keep them following him. No matter how the church fumbles it, the church is going to fumble it, Carrie. Leaders suck. You know, we all make mistakes. We all let everybody down. We all don't say enough about this and say too much about that. We're all good, always going to make that mistakes. But Sienna, listen to me. I need you to focus on Jesus, not the church and how it fumbles stuff. That will always, you know. So I think that becomes part of the entire message of what we bring to the church. And uh, you got to clear away the hypocrisy and the politics and the nonsense and put Jesus on the table and say, everyone just focus on him. Well, Mark, as always, it is fascinating and never boring to hang out. <laughs> well, thanks for having me, brother. Uh, tell me, uh, so the book's called The Problem of Jesus, available yep. anywhere books are found. Where can people find you? Uh, Instagram, just look up my name, Mark A. Clark. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, Twitter and Facebook, all those places. All the, I try all the to, places. All the places I try to. Uh, actually, Instagram is Mark underscore Clark. I'm sure if there they just go. type in my name, they'll find me. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, all the places and just trying to post stuff to encourage people and point people toward Jesus. And uh, yeah, excited for people to take this and, and use it in whatever way it's going to help them. So, Well, Mark, thanks so much and can't wait till next time. Thanks for having me, brother. Well, I hope today's episode was helpful to you. You can always get more by subscribing to my channel. I also have a lot more content over at kerryneuhoff.com for leaders in business and leaders in churches. And uh, you can get transcripts of this episode there and so much more, plus some other stuff I do for leaders. So head on over there to discover more at kerryneuhoff.com. And in the meantime, I really hope our time together today has helped you lead like never before.